Hey, everybody. I think we're just about ready to start. My watch is horribly incorrect, but my phone seems to be accurate. So let's go ahead and kick this off. Um, thanks for coming. We're going to chat a little bit about the user research process for prototype and pre-production and R&D um, for Riot Games. Uh, so uh, I am Austin Harley. Uh, I head up the central user research team. This is Tom. Tom, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Tom Barnes. I'm a senior user researcher in Riot R&D. Uh, we've got two breakouts here that uh, Austin loves Risk of Rain too, and I love Fire Emblem. That's relevant because you're going to see some things on these slides. Not as much in the original presentation, but uh, they are there. So um, uh, to kick this off, uh, we are from Riot Games. Um, we make uh, games such as League of Legends, Valorant, TFT, Wild Rift, Legends, Rune, Terra. Um, uh, beyond the general introduction, this is notable because the kind of games we tend to make are, are meant to be, you've probably heard the term genre defining at one of our talks before, these, um, these sort of differentiating, often you know, large, long played experiences. Um, and that stems a little bit from this mission of you know, wanting to be the most player focused game company in the world. So really trying to figure out what's going to be awesome for players. So um, a little bit of a preamble. In coming up with this talk, it was actually a really interesting challenge. And thankfully, I have a, a, a team that's brutally honest with me. And one of the things that came up was, hey, uh, I'm not sure if everything you're talking about here, even though you're going step by step through this process, is going to really resonate with folks. And that is ultimately the goal, is to, to be worth y'all's time. And what, what was going on is that it's, it's kind of hard to know where everybody is, both in their journey in user research, how much they've been exposed to R&D, um, how many of these concepts are going to be familiar or not. So I would say sort of this. Um, there's going to be some parts where I'm going to try and focus on what I think is interesting or different about what we do. There's going to be some stuff that I've made an assumption that I'm like, I think this is just like basic known sort of user research craft, good research craft, um, and probably skim over that, and I'll call those out in the moment. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions or have conversations about that stuff afterwards. And if I did make a poor assumption there, that's fine. Call me out on it. We can chat afterwards. Um, and I think that's about it. So um, let's go ahead and, uh, and, and talk about what we're going to do. The first two sections here are really just setting the stage and foundations um, for the second part around the actual user research process that we follow at R&D at Riot. And then we'll end with some summary and closing thoughts. And, and I would say, like, if, if at the end of the, this talk, y'all take at least a thing away that's a useful piece of conversation, that's great. That is, I think, sort of the goal. Uh, I never had the expectation going any, into any conference talk that it's somehow just going to like blow everybody's mind. So let's start with R&D at Riot. <clears throat> R&D is hard. Uh, it is very hard. It is highly ambiguous. This isn't to uh, say that working on live games is not hard. It is very hard as well. Uh, there's sort of this interesting, unique challenge when working in R&D because you don't exactly know where you're going or what you're doing. I sort of liken it to this like oldie but goldie meme of like, hey, yo, yeah, just you know, you start with some circles and then you just draw the owl. Except in R&D, it's like, is it an owl? I don't know. Like, you'll get to this point in the process, for, for those of you who have been in it, where, like, you're, you have a, a vision. The team has a vision. But, like, maybe it's an owl. Maybe it's a cat. I don't know. We might find out it's a cat partway through. And cats and owls don't mix super well. You get the idea. Um, and this is a lot for an EP or a game director to deal with, right? There's so many directions you can go. And again, going back to sort of what Riot's trying to do, particularly if you're in the space of trying to make something really different and, and big and, and played for a long time, that's a lot to deal with. On the researcher side, you also have this other interesting challenge where you don't have the ability to just look at like, a thousand people playing the game that's being made right now. You might not even have the game in software. You might be dealing with paper prototypes. And so uh, the methods and approaches and way to navigate that ambiguity are, are different. So enter the thesis-based approach to development. This is what Riot takes uh, when we think about developing a game. And, and effectively, what this is is looking at the space for an opportunity of some kind, right? An underserved audience, uh, gamers, you know, or a genre that hasn't been touched in years but has some spark, or maybe something that's new on the scene. That you're like, this game is sick. It's about to pop off. Yeah, maybe it's like, you know, indie or janky in some way, and that's great, but we want to, we want to like elevate that in some way, and that's not to knock indies, and I love indie games, but it's more like when you're trying to make something that's big, you're like, I think there's something here that could reach way more players, so we want to do that. And, um, you know, diagnosing ultimately how you're going to do that, how this opportunity 
um, can be realized in, in sort of a thoughtful way. Um, you know, I think the way that we often say it is like, you know, your thesis should articulate what the core innovation area of your game is and, and you know, any key risks or assumptions that you have and, and a way to sort of work through those. And the reason we do this and, and why we think it's useful to help navigate that ambiguity is we can take that, we can take this thesis, this statement, and turn it into something that's more testable, which is where research, uh, you know, shines. And um, my coworker Alex later is actually going to talk in a more detailed example. Um, and there's you know some interesting links at uh, Riot uh, R&D that you can look to uh, to speak more to it. But I'm going to go through a quick example that will hopefully um, set the stage and, and ground things for the rest of the presentation. So. Uh, I don't know how easy this text is to read, but imagine we've narrowed the space. We decided we want to make a new awesome tactical RPG that players are going to love, right? We've at least gone from it could be any game to it's this kind of genre. Even in that space, I mean, there's a lot, right? Like, is it traditional Final Fantasy tactics style? Are we talking about, like, the rock, paper, scissors combat of Fire Emblem? You can't see to the bottom, but I've got, like, Baldur's Gate 3, hopefully comes out this year, um, or, you know, Divinity 2, uh, which is, like, not technically turn-based, but you kind of play it turn-based, at least when combat comes. And, and so where do you go, right? What do you do? And what we might do then, and again, this is sort of a hypothetical for the use of this presentation, is say, we believe players will love a turn-based tactical RPG that uses a popular IP, has compelling characters and narrative, enables players to be connected to others via sort of this life sim style approach, and that will also synergize with combat. And hey, maybe one of the things we saw in the market is like, these games are really complex. It's really hard to learn, and, and when you do make a mistake, it's very punitive. So we want to lower the entry barrier for folks. And when you break it down like that, you might get something like Fire Emblem Three Houses. Spoiler, you're going to see more of this in the presentation. Um, and no, no, I did not work on this game. I'm sure there's another articulation from that. I don't even know if they think about it in sort of a thesis-based approach. But you can see how these things tie to a specific opportunity or realization of that game that could exist. So with that thesis in mind, um, let's, let's talk about the structure of development in which it fits. So this is one of the first areas where I'm just going to breeze through it and make some assumptions about what folks know. We have development, basically development phases and gates. They're relatively standard, but at a high level, we have prototype, which is about should we make this thing, pre-production, which is how do we make this thing, or like can we make this thing, more about the execution level, and then you know production, which is like let's go, let's go make the thing. And each of these are sort of about proving a particular thing that needs to be true about this for us to be convinced that we should continue building the thing. And each of these divisions between gate or between uh, phases has a, a gate, a significant checkpoint where we're like everybody's looking to be like should we keep going. This is relevant because, um, really this, um, these gates are broken down into experiential milestones, and we think these are really key to development. The way I would articulate an experiential milestone is, is basically it's taking portions of that core thesis and building it out in a way that allows you to say, like, look at it and say, like, hey, did we do the thing? Have we created the experience that we think when we build a lot of these is going to layer up into players really loving this experience? So if we take our Fire Emblem example and keep going with it, um, let's say we've aligned on this core point of like, hey, it has compelling characters and narrative. We think that's something that's going to drive players. Um, like a toy example of this is, well, we might break that up into, hey, does the game have compelling characters? Does it have compelling narrative? And hey, do these things work well together because, you know, intuitively we sort of know they need to for this to feel good, right? And this is again, like maybe milestone one is about compelling characters because we're like, hey, the team already has some really good ideas and we have to start somewhere, uh, you know, when it comes to characters. And then once we have that, we're like, okay, well, cool. Like we have some thoughts about using that to layer in narrative and then ultimately we test the whole thing together, right? Um, so we'll see a deeper dive into this and how this all layers in, but that's a good, I think, sort of overview of how this might work. Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about discipline foundations, um, specifically how Insights works at the company and how the team that we, uh, we are on functions and is structured. Uh, so really, like the way we operate as a discipline enables this process to work. We could have milestones and gates, and I don't think it would go forward if we didn't have these portions of it. And, and a lot of that boils down to like we just have really strong relationships with our teams. This has been sort of a recurring theme throughout Grux and like in building that, we're in a fortunate place where we do, and, and it really stems from a few things. One, Insights work at Riot is treated as development work. Teams are expected to hire 
uh, inside structures within their own team, which report to the, the EP, or actually in many cases, the product manager of that team, it goes up. It's not that, that the information they generate doesn't go to stakeholders, it does, but they're working very closely with the team, the design leads, all those folks, and that's, that's the starting point. Um, which is which is different from a third party publishing model where you are you know part of the publisher and you're sort of asked to swoop in and like and help test the thing additionally we take a data informed not data driven approach i think this term is a little more common now when i started in the industry it was very much data driven not necessarily user research but just like research in general i feel like out in tech um and if you've seen a riot talk you're also probably familiar with this but effectively like it is one useful information stream in the process it is not c test do x right and this ties into the fact that we also have multifaceted accountability structures. There's often, I would say, three key players in any significant decision-making process. You've got the researcher um, or insights, depending on what nature of, of work was, uh, data work was going into it. You've got the, the team, and then you've got whatever stakeholders are on the project, often senior leadership and something like that. And this ends up creating a situation where the work that we do ends up pretty trusted and teams are pretty hungry for it, which is, which is great. At the same time, uh, our team is actually somewhat centralized. Um, we follow a central embed structure, a hybridized central embed structure, where we have each person on the team uh, on about one to two games in R&D. Um, and there's a reason why we deviate from the norm um, and follow this. One is uh, we want to maintain the value of embedding for the reasons that we've all talked about, I think, in this conference and, and through the years. It's really, really valuable. Um, at the same time, Teams in R&D tend to be fairly small, especially earlier on in development. Um, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. You have a lot more agility. Um, at the same time, there's not necessarily a ton of research work to do, or I should put it differently, that work can come in peaks and valleys, right? And so having somebody full-time embedded on that team doesn't always make sense, and you don't want somebody just sitting there twirling their thumbs. <clears throat> At the same time, R&D is also kind of volatile sometimes, and I don't mean in like literally an explosive way, but it's hard to know. You might come into an intractable problem where you just have to go dark for a while and go think, and designers need to, to, to be their awesome selves and figure out a tricky problem, or the team might spin down, or you might take a completely different direction and pivot somewhere else. And in that situation, it's better to have the expectation set that somebody is there for as long as it makes sense for them to be there, but is capable of moving somewhere else and having that flexibility to go to a different game team and work on um, a different but you know similar broad problem, which kind of brings us to the next point, which is while the researchers work on different games, a lot of the core stuff that we're trying to do, which we'll talk to in a minute, is similar and benefits from having a group with, um, with a similar sort of mission and value set uh, knowledge sharing, supporting each other, et cetera. <clears throat> what this ends up meaning is the general shape of researchers uh, tends to look something like this. Research craft um, is obviously you know, paramount. You need, you need good stuff. But we also see uh, a lot of value in people hanging the lens of both game design and product management. Game design from the, well, I think this was brought up earlier. I want to say in, um, in maybe Kirk's talk or, or Laney's were like, speaking the language is really, really valuable. And often the problems you encounter are more abstract in nature. Um, and on the product management side, a lot of the questions that will often end up getting asked are around hey, what's going on out in the world? How does this game make sense within that space? What is the core direction? Rather than the more tactical, like what is the exact research study? Um, and, you know, uh, it kind of looks like Kirby, which is pretty fun. Um, <laughs> uh, mostly I put this there because when I put the Venn diagram, I'm like, that looks pretty cute. But then I was thinking about it, it's actually kind of appropriate because when you take into the context of R&D, the ambiguity, also the need for flexibility, yeah, I mean, you kind of just need to, to go into a space, figure out what they need, take whatever shape. Sometimes that is a rock that drops from the sky. Sometimes it's a ball of fire, right, whatever. And, um, and that flexibility lends itself really well uh, to supporting the teams. Um, and it's not just about being a good researcher. So with that foundational stuff out of the way, I want to start talking about the actual goals, philosophy, and process of, of what we're trying to do here. So to start, really the goal is validating the game thesis. That's you know, probably apparent from what we've talked about so far. Um, the way that I tend to think about this is really about product audience fit, right? Um, which is, hey, 
players have a specific need, ideally one that you've identified by looking at the opportunity out there. And really, we're trying to figure out what is going to really fit in their lives. And I think everybody's had a game like this, right? Something where you're like, you just keep coming back to it. Maybe you didn't even know it was exactly what you wanted, but it hits, right? Like it slaps. It's really, really good, and you just want to play it a lot. And that's that's a lot of where our focus in this early development is, is like, is it something that you really want to engage deeply with? And so to that end, we generally have two main areas of work that support validating the game thesis, right? I would say roughly it breaks down into helping to define the audience of the game and validating holistic resonance of the game. Um, I, I wanna, the audience piece is really interesting because while we have some idea early on of who these folk are, and, and Tom will talk about this a little bit more later, how refined that vision is, and frankly, how refined it needs to be at that early phase is something contextual that needs to be figured out. Sometimes the opportunity you're dealing with has a very known audience, and sometimes it's very blue ocean. You're just like, who could these people be? Um, that means that a lot of the work that we do, sorry, this is uh, blocked by um, the little box down there, is, is just doing audience research and lots of play testing. That ends up being the bulk of, of what takes our time. So um, step one in the process is we embed a user researcher uh, on these teams uh, that we're working with. But we also embed a strategy point of contact. And I want to talk a little bit about this because it deviates from sort of where the focus has been so far. The strategy point of contact is somebody who, well, is kind of a strategist, right? Like their goal is helping with these bigger picture questions around thesis refinement. What is the potential audience size? What is the opportunity? And is the thesis that you're doing aligned with that opportunity in sort of a logical framework kind of way? They might also help articulate what the the validation plan for this thing is, which is more than just, hey, which specific research project, but like, how do these things stack up? What's most important to focus on? These tend to be folks that are more senior in insights within central R&D. Sometimes these are user researchers, as we'll see. Sometimes they're not on our team at all. And we also embed a user research point of contact, which tends to be more the tactician, right? And these folks are the ones who do the study design, the study execution. Uh, that is not reductive. That is a non-trivial task, right? There's a lot of work, as everybody here knows, uh, uh, going into making a good study. Um, but they're the ones who, who do the thing. And as I mentioned, over time, sometimes they end up being one and the same. We have user research points of contact who have developed, uh, gotten more senior, and they end up being both the strategy point of contact and the user research point of contact, helping with both. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom now to talk about basically the initial process of embedding and what that's like, because Tom lives this way more than I do these days. I do like leadery stuff. Uh, he's the one actually working with folks. So Tom, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Cool. So yeah, I am the user research in, or the user researcher, I should say, in question here. I've also done a little bit of strategy POC work, but most of my work is user research. At this point, I've embedded, I think, on six plus games in development for Riot, and so I have a fair bit of experience with the embed process. I'll just talk through a few quick things here that I like to do at the very start of the embedding process. So sharpening the thesis, as Austin already mentioned, it's usually between the devs and the strategy point of context to actually establish and define the thesis. I occasionally come in and do that if it's very early on a project, but usually when I'm brought in, it's all about polishing and sharpening that thesis. Research work is like a natural fit for this. Iterative testing is always gonna lead to further polish on your understanding of what your game is and who it is for. And so that's kind of like a default thing that we lead into. But the most important thing when joining a new team is making sure that if they don't have a sharply defined thesis, I'm helping them get there and that I also understand it as well as they do. Key audiences is huge for us. So when it comes to audience definition, we use a lot of different sources. It comes from the researchers, the strategy point of contact, the stakeholders, the devs, historical insights. We reference all of these things to help define what we think are our core, our bullseye, whatever terminology you want to use audiences are. And so once we have that information, we're essentially looking to see, OK, you know, can we, can we get the core and the bullseye? But mostly for research, can we validate that we're correct about this? Um, fortunately, we have a very good hit rate with this, so I usually find that when I'm doing the validation studies, I don't have to make a whole lot of adjustments, usually, to what we think our core audiences are. But even knowing that is very helpful. That adds certainty to the whole situation. And if there are major you know, changes that we need to do, either to the game or to the audiences that we're targeting, it's great to get that early. And then the third thing is partnerships. Everybody goes about partnerships in different ways, but I think a lot of people here can agree. Uh, being a research partner is a role that you desire context more than maybe some other partnerships do. 
So, you know, when I say context, I mean things like, what is the game they're working on? What are games that are similar to it? You know, what is the team working on? How do they operate? These are all things that once you know these, you are able to do research more effectively for the teams that you support. Everyone's got a different approach to this. Everybody's got a different ability to embed with their teams. In my particular case, I like to do a few things. I host bi-weekly syncs with my team leads that are just purely research specific. So either we discuss you know, ongoing research or research that we want to plan out. I also attend at least one weekly play test for my games. Again, we do have stages in development where there is no game, that's fine. Uh, but for when we do, I do try and attend at least weekly for that. And then I go to one or two you know, dev team meetings, whatever those might be. Every team has their own different rituals, but usually there's one to two of those where I can gather a lot of context and stay abreast of the situation. So let's talk a little bit about thesis. I said on the last slide that you know, research is there to help polish the thesis. That is true. And part of this process for us, um, we're actually going to go into this in more detail later. So we are going to have a talk at 1 PM today on the thesis validation framework that we use. Alex Arndt will be running that. And so uh, if you want to join us back in here at 1 PM, we'll go in real detail here. I'll just do like a high level right now. So one of the ways that we like to think about thesis, your terminology might vary, is we have a thesis. We have pillars to that thesis, and those pillars have components. And at the components level, we're starting to think about things that are actually actionable for research. So we might have, you know, at that point, questions that we can put on a survey or in a discussion guide or for a user interview, and we can actually get feedback on those. Once we have these thesis components, we put them through our thesis validation framework model. And what we do with that is it's essentially prioritization. We use things, I'll give a, like a quick example. You might scale it against like, how important is this component versus how ambiguous is it? So is it something that we feel like we know how to build it with certainty or it's something like very novel for us that we're not sure about? We map out all those things and that helps us get priority. Once we've got priority on these components, at that point, you know, we take them back to the teams and that helps inform roadmap, milestones, all that sort of stuff. This is where the researchers become more of an advisor. You start to bleed a little bit into that strategy role and you're actually helping inform, you know, the plans going forward for the next year or more. And I think at this point I'll pass it back to Austin for a little bit. Thanks, Tom. The, um, I think the last bit that I would add here is, um, there's a lot of emphasis for us on trying to identify the parts of the game, the thesis, that are going to be um, the most impactful and the riskiest early on, um, because this is where we think we're going to have the most impact on the direction and, and front load a lot of that rather than by the time the game launches and realizing it later. Um, generally speaking, I would say we're in the business of, of building confidence, right? Like that's kind of the core output that we, we deliver as a team. And this is our means of going about it, obviously iteratively over time and building that, but also a lot of front loading and trying to figure out what's going to deliver the most value right away. So um, let's, let's do a little bit of a, a breakdown of, of the milestone process itself. I alluded to it uh, lightly earlier, um, <clears throat> but it looks something like this. Imagine we're working in the early prototyping phase. Um, we might break down and prototyping might end up having three milestones. And this number is, is entirely variable depending on the thesis, depending on what you find as you test previous milestones, it can move. Each milestone itself can also vary in length based on the team and their working context and culture, but it's a boxed period of time where you have a particular goal in mind. And the first thing that you'll do is establish whatever that goal is. Earlier we had talked about compelling characters, but depending on the game and genre, it could be whatever, right? Um, from then, planning of the milestone work uh, that will go into the build happens. This is the point where the user research point of contact tends to be really, really engaged in the process because if the team is trying to validate a particular experience, it's beneficial to have the researcher going like, all right, well, this is what I think needs to be true of the state of what we're gonna put in front of players in order to get you the information that you need. That could be something in software, that could be paper prototyping, it could even potentially be conceptual depending on what they're trying to validate at that phase. Then the team goes and builds the thing, right? They do their awesome work. Um, at the same time, the user researcher at this point is generally working on the study or the study design itself. Depending on the length of the milestone, uh, there might be a check-in play test. We, we call these check-in play tests. Um, and these uh, can take a couple of forms. And Tom, correct me if I miss it, mess any of this up. But basically, um, sometimes if there's enough that's being developed, they can be directional tests on like, hey, is there anything like, we've got enough in here. Is there anything really big that we should know right now? Are we tacking in the right direction? Um, 
They can also be dry runs for a more significant end of milestone playtest. I would say these are the most common where at the end of every milestone, there is expected to be some kind of playtest that happens. That might be with internal employees, that might be with, with external players, like actual players coming in. Um, and you know that playtest tends to support validation on the decision of whether this thing went the way that they thought it should in terms of, of the milestone success. As we know, having dry runs of significant playtests is generally a good idea. Once that data is in, it's synthesized, um, we make decisions and we integrate, and it feeds back into the process. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about this piece about designing success, or I should say determining success, um, and there's two relevant pieces. One is um, the metrics that we leverage to do this. I can't talk about the very specific ones, but I do wanna talk about the high-level categories that we use. We use a combination of holistic benchmarking and playtest specific uh, metrics to basically inform what went down. So what I mean by holistic benchmarking is, and sorry, the text here is a little bit small, um, these are benchmarks that are measured across all games in development at Riot and are largely targeting this idea of like, hey, is, is this whole experience resonating with folks in some way? Um, it also is useful for demonstrating incremental progress over time. So we can use it both as a piece of at significant milestones when there's enough game there to be like, hey, do players really like this? Also, we can look and see if this kind of goes up into the right over time, as we generally like to see. Um, and, and that's relevant because not every test or every slice of the game is going to be perfectly tuned to allow us to get a really big holistic read. And um, this is where some of the playtest specific metrics come in. And so these tend to be metrics that are aligned both to the milestone goals and likely whatever the game level KPIs and diagnostics are. Um, I know KPIs as a terminology can vary, but it's basically like what the game cares about at a high level in terms of how it evaluates success. Those can overlap with the holistic metrics sometimes, and there's some pieces of it that do, but there can also be things that are very specific to that audience and their needs in some way, whereas the holistic are meant to literally bri uh, bridge kind of all, all experiences. Um, and so this combination allows us to both get a read on, hey, is this thing holistically resonating with players? Um, is there something specific about this game that's going well or not at a high level? And if it's not, what are the things that are working well or not? So you get a couple of la like basically layers or levels going on. For this next one, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tom because as much as the metrics are useful, the, the process and engaging with stakeholders afterwards is, uh, I would say, as or even more valuable. Cool, yeah. So this is something I think we've touched on a little bit so far, but very important to point out. When it comes to research, the success is not binary. The insights is just one part. It's not a yes or no. We actually employ what we consider kind of like a triple checks system when it comes to moving a project forward, whether it's to another gate or another stage of development, or even just like more basic level milestones. We tend to be talking to three different parties. There's usually the playtest results that are coming out of research ourselves. We've got, you know, the development team themselves obviously has a lot of perspective to give, and then stakeholders. And so a few of the reasons why we go about this, just like three that I can think of off the top of my head. So for one thing, research, it's not a monolith, right? If you rely completely on the research to decide whether or not you're gonna move forward with a project or how the progress is going, that can be a bit rigid. In a worst case scenario, you might even reach a point where it's, it's too decisive and the dev teams that you work with balk at it or they you know, don't wanna engage with research or maybe they don't even act on your findings. You definitely don't wanna have that. The second thing is the development team, as you might expect, they're the content experts, right? They have the expertise here. They are making their own game. They are playing similar games if they exist. They are, they are in the weeds. And so if the development team has a concern with their progress or what they're working on, even if that concern is not reflected by the play testers, you know, development team's gonna have priority here. They'll, they'll get as much time as they need to work through the problems that they have. And then the third year are the stakeholders. The stakeholders do a lot. Uh, but two things off the top of my head that I can think of are, well, one, they have company context. So maybe there's a funding issue. Maybe there's a change in market or the company wants to target different games or is going to make a pivot more broadly, that sort of thing. That sort of information is super helpful because you know it doesn't necessarily matter how well or how poorly or whatever your project is doing. If there's a different change in context with the company, you need to know that to inform the decision. The other thing that they offer is they understand what good looks like. These stakeholders, or at least many of the ones we work with, they tend to work across a lot of different projects. They've done a lot of projects. They have historical context. So when a game is in prototype, they have a fairly good understanding of like, well, I expect to maybe see these scores, or I, I'm hoping to hear this from players because other games that have succeeded in the past had this. And so they're able to provide a lot of that kind of like further reach context. 
Some people might argue that this like triple set of checks and balances, it can be a bit of a hurdle or even a burden for teams to move forward. I wouldn't disagree, but I would say that we've gotten a ton of value out of this system. In particular, especially with all the different projects we have in R&D, this has helped us to avoid situations like you kind of let a team go off on their own and you come back two years later and they're either completely off the rails with their thesis or they're like not targeting their initial audiences at all. And you either have to scrap the project or do like a major revision, something like that. By keeping up with this and really, you know, addressing all three of these groups and their needs at different points of progression, we're keeping ourselves honest and we're making sure that we're staying on track with our projects. Pass it back to Austin. Thank you, Tom. Um, one other thing I would note here is much as the research relationship with, with the team is pretty good, um, I would also say the, the, the team's relationship with stakeholders is pretty good. Um, the, the stakeholders at the company generally have a lot of experience with games and play them a lot themselves. There's always some nuance to that, and the team is going to be a much deeper expert on the space than folks who literally have to keep abreast of all the things going on, but that definitely helps this process work too. Um, so let's bring it all together. Um, let's take our Fire Emblem example from before. We'll run it through the process and what it might look like. And again, these are hypotheticals, but let's say, and sorry, this is sort of blocked by the thing, um, the initial milestone goal that we've established uh, is focused on this idea of compelling characters um, and, and wanting to understand whether players are engaging or, or interested in the, the relationship aspect, want to build relationship with these characters. So the milestone work that goes into it is they, they might decide, hey, we need a small set of characters plus activities that the players can do in a 3D environment to build relationships with those characters. And like probably enough story with these characters, story in the form of like relationship progression to see if that's gonna be compelling for those folks. The team will go and build the experience um, the researcher puts a plan together, likely informed by the, the work that they did in the, the milestone work planning on what is going to be uh, the best way to test this. Then a test is run at the end of the milestone. The data is synthesized and maybe we found, hey, players find the idea of relationships compelling, but the activities themselves were like super boring. Uh, they did not want to do them. They have enough context from other games with relationships and this that they think there's something here, but work needs to be done in this way. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting point where there's forks in the road, right? We're going to go into milestone two, but milestone two, depending on the what the stakeholders think and what they can solve, might be, hey, we actually need to solve this problem. We're not sure, given everything that we've done, what activities are going to be good. We thought these were going to be killer, and we need to go back to the drawing board. It's also entirely viable to like, look, all we really needed to know at this phase was we need enough confidence that players cared or had the potential to care about these relationship vignettes that we're talking about. We'll figure out the activity stuff later. There is way higher risk stuff for us to solve now. We're gonna, we're gonna table that and come back to it at a point in time later in development. And that's frankly a healthy process and what it might look like because there's not necessarily a, a clear answer every single time or at least um, not one that the research is gonna tell you directly. So um, lastly, I want to talk about the playtesting design framework that we use. This is one of those areas where I'm going to kind of breeze through. I'm not going to talk about very specific study design because I think this is just like good fundamental UR craft. Um, I'll talk to the framework. Um, I'll go through it. And then if you all have questions afterwards, we can dig in. At a high level, as a game develops, we want to build uh, and we want to build more confidence over time. The scope and rigor of testing tends to increase. Um, and so this roughly breaks down into what I would say is like five categories. On the audience side, we generally start with the folks who are most likely to want to play this game. Eventually, as we hit pre-production and production, it starts to branch out to like literally anybody we think would reasonably interested in playing this experience. The game focus tends to start fairly narrow with slices, as we've sort of articulated here, and eventually we're talking about uh, potentially playing the whole thing if that's an online, you know, uh, core loop style MOBA game. It might be lots of rounds of it, um, uh, of like the whole loop of the experience. It might be the whole game if it's narrative style, right? Uh, sample size tends to start really small, as you would expect, and then branches out to very large, um, especially as you reach production, alpha, beta style testing. Um, the length, uh, we use this term basic mastery. I, I, I think I've heard variations of this here, but it's basically, we start off with the idea of like, hey, you need to get to some baseline level of experience with this game to be able to articulate answers and be informed about your own reflections on this, such that we can like, you know, say like, okay, cool, you get it, tell us if you like it. Right? Not you get it and you like it, it's like, do you get it enough to tell us whether you like the thing or not? So that tends to be a lot of the focus early on as the game goes further in development. That's when we're literally playing kind of the whole thing, right? 
And then on the control side, early on, very heavily controlled, both I would say in terms of the setting, so it tends to be very much in lab setting, and then also on a task-wise basis, right? Like we might have them focused on specific neuro slices. As time goes on, more naturalistic, more uncontrolled, more free reign over whatever could be experienced in the game. So as I said, I think this is pretty common knowledge, but it's worth just noting this is the practice we generally follow. Um, so uh, we, have, we have come near to the end of the talk. Uh, I'll summarize what I think is probably, you know, maybe the most important takeaway, which is, you know, we have kind of a process and an outcome that we're driving towards. On the process side, it's really three things. Sorry, it's blocked. Um, this doesn't work, or I should say what allows this to work is your games can articulate a thesis, like a, a compelling and well thought out thesis. Um, you have milestone driven development, and you have embedded user research. Those three things working together tends to drive to this outcome of like higher confidence earlier in development and a system for continually building confidence throughout the development cycle. So some closing thoughts. Um, I sort of mentioned earlier on, like there's no one sized fits all approach to these complicated problems. People have developed games, very excellent games for many, many years using different user research techniques. Um, it is, it is a series of intentional choices about what we think works well. We like this, I'll talk through why, but at the same time, there are, there are choices that we're making and those choices have costs, right? And this is important because the context of your organization and your situation may be different. <clears throat> so I'll talk through just a couple of these. There's a number of them, but I thought these were relevant uh, uh, to bring up to sort of drive this discussion. An example of, of an intentional choice is we focus on resonance and audience a lot because we think that's good for sort of de-risking things early on. But the reality is there's like a lot of stuff we just don't do or have as much skill in. Not so much that we could never develop that capability, but like we don't UX or we don't do usability tests. Now, that's not as valuable early on in development we found, but it also means that when that comes up, we just don't have as much muscle there, right? Um, and, and that's gonna span across a number of areas, also depending on the games that you're developing at the company, right? <clears throat> Additionally, we do lots of play testing, and I think it would not be hard to imagine that this audience would think that's a good thing, and it generally is a very good thing. I'm in favor of more play testing, but I would say probably I'm more in favor of enough play testing to get what you need. And play testing does have overhead, right? Like this is, I'm sure everybody here has encountered this with dev teams like, wait, well, we got to get a stable bit what? You know? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, spiciness aside, right, like there is a very real cost to sort of doing that. And there are some situations where it might not make as much sense, even sort of in R&D, if you happen to be doing a space where you're like, hey, we've actually mitigated most of the risk by looking at this other thing that's going on in the market and being like, that's really sick. It's about to pop off. We just need to make one or two tweaks that our designers have a lot of confidence in, and we need to go fast, right? That's a space where you might make an intentional choice to not avoid playtesting entirely, but dial it down. You might not do as robust of an approach to this, right? Um, and so again, intentional choices. And then lastly, we tend to have heavy team integration. That is in general a massive plus, but one of the things that comes with this is researchers are not just asked to deliver a report and then you know get the hell out of the room, right? We're often being asked for the subjective opinion about what's going on because by embedding, we're also building a lot of context on the game, the product, the market, et cetera, and end up being these advisors. That means we're injecting more bias into it. Again, we think it's worth it for the ultimate cause, but depending on what the needs and situation in your organization are, like you might want more removal there in that pace or in that space. So in the end, right, like the goal of this talk is hopefully there's a thing here you can sort of take away. It's a little bit of a whirlwind tour, um, and it's not meant to be sort of one size fits all. And um, yeah, hopefully this was useful for y'all, and thank you so much for the time. We're here for questions if anybody has any. Oh, there's questions. Oh, hello. Um, I believe that I need to repeat the questions, and what is, let's get up the interface for the, the uh, questions on Zoom as well. Did we do it? We did the thing. Okay. What's up? Yeah, I'm pausing because I it's a space where I can't actually say what the specific ones that we do are, but I can talk a little bit about the process. Yeah, so I, I would say in terms of making them usable, um, some of it I alluded to. Uh, oh, 
Oh, sorry, yeah. The question was, um, do we have any, can I provide any more sort of context on the process of making holistic benchmarks and what's gonna be useful across, um, uh, you know, for, for these? Um, so I guess a, a couple of off-the-cuff thoughts of, of what you, you could do here. One is, I would say, um, they, they can and probably should be applicable across all games. I don't think that's the only model that could work. I think you could further segment them. But generally speaking, the kind of thing that we're aiming towards with these, at the very least, is something that most games should ad like strive towards, right? Like, which is this idea of, like, do you really want to engage and play this thing a lot, right? If your company context is somewhat different or the kind of game you're making is different, it's like literally not meant to be played in that specific way, then I would sort of change that approach. Um, as for using them across, uh, like I, I would keep them relatively the same. Other guidance I would give is I don't think you need like 500 of these, right? Like I think you can probably get away with a relatively small set of things that measure at a sufficiently high level. Um, in terms of the, um, <clears throat> uh, we do have reference ranges. I would say fairly frequently that we use, and that just comes as the nature of doing benchmarks. Um, in addition to measuring internal games, you can also, uh, like external games are a, a good beat as well. It's a little bit tricky because the context of the game is pretty different. Like, it's not exactly apples to, you know, apples to apples when you're talking about a game that's literally barely playable versus a fully released, potentially AAA title. Um, but you can gain, I think, some insight from that. Um, Tom, anything? Yeah, I'll throw some on there. One other thing is speaking to like the universalness of those benchmarks. That is part of the way in which we actually like set our standards and our like you know our frame for it. And so you may have a benchmark that you design. You're like, okay, but is this an actual good benchmark? If it's universal enough and you can run it across enough studies, you know, if you get 18 studies with across different products, you can then look at the scores there and set your thresholds, right? And so you you probably won't have. You may have an instinct for your thresholds. You may have an instinct for the, whether or not the question is actually a good one. But until you have an actual cluster of data that you've worked with, you're not going to feel very confident in it. And once you reach that point, it feels great because you can take it back to the stakeholders and be like, we ran this with 18 other games. And like, we, we know what good looks like when it comes to this very specific item now. Um, one last thing that I would add on this, too, is we do like a lot of logical frameworking in general. And so when it comes to the idea of what's going to be like a super valid measure that's actually provable out in the world and predicts success in some way, like that is, um, if you have it, tell me, <laughs> please. We'll take anything. A lot of what we end up doing is like just a lot of good fundamentals um, or, or trying to get a lot of good logical trained fundamentals because especially since the game has not been released and there's a lot of other factors, um, it's, it's, that's what you have that I think makes the most sense, right? Um, and the reason why I bring that up is I think you can get into the weeds with benchmarks on being like, is this, does this work? Is it gonna be good? You know what I mean? And like, in some ways, yeah, you need some rigor in that process for sure. And you should have a lot of experts weighing in and, and talking through it and beating it up. Bringing a lot of people in the room is always good. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, the process of measuring them across a lot of things and being able to see how it performs and then iterating probably is more valuable than somehow trying to get the perfect metric. Anyway, go ahead. Tom, this might be one for you. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah. So just to reframe the question for everybody online. So the, the framing was just like ways, if it's very early on, like paper prototype or MVP, trying to help teams understand what they should deliver on to us so that we can actually do good research for them. Yeah, so I've done a few different things here. I haven't done a whole lot of paper prototyping in a while. Uh, I've done a little bit in Figma and some other like concept style work, but when it comes to working with the teams on this, we usually have a bit of a back and forth. What I often do is I don't even start necessarily with what they need to be providing me. I usually go for them and still get the high level goals questions, the, you know, their main topics of interest. Those things usually, the, the teams I work with are a lot of really smart people. Once they've written those things down, they're usually like, oh man, I need to go build that, right? And they like tend to handle that themselves. But what I'll often do is generate a lot of that early on, even, even a month out. Um, and while most of the stuff will already be built for, at that point, I usually scope through all that and say, hey, I just played through the build. I see that these two or three things are well represented. You're very interested in this topic, but I didn't see this represent the build at all. And at that point, they are either going to talk through what they have 
and either say like, oh, we're going to have this in a month, or it is in there and you missed it, and it just improves my context as the researcher, or they're going to say, okay, what do you think we need to be providing in this build for you to get adequate signal on this topic? And, you know, that can vary depending on the build. Um, sometimes I say, oh, you know, I might just put it into the script for the onboarding deck that I run. There just might be some context I need to deliver onto the teams. Other times it might be like, if you want me to get solid signal on this, I'm going to need a feature. And if you don't have time to build that feature, we should defer this topic until, you know, the next play test, things like that. Yeah. Hello. I don't think I've actually encountered that. Tom, have you? I can speak a little bit to this one. I have not encountered this in a while because oh, we... Sorry. We should repeat oh. the question. Yeah, sorry. The question is, do teams uh, sometimes feel stifled by uh, having external benchmarking, or not external, holistic benchmarking and feeling like they need to hit a particular score to be evaluated well? <laughs> Which is a very valid question. Yeah, so I feel like we haven't run into this in a while, but that's because we did early on and we've kind of worked our way through it. Um, so we, we provide a lot of context these days, particularly Austin mentioned the check-in studies that we do. We often use the check-ins in a way where it's like, hey, we're gonna collect the holistic benchmarks because we like to do that. We always like to have those. But perhaps for this check-in, like that's not gonna go to stakeholders. Like this is purely for your edification as a team. And so they're still kind of on that horn of like, oh, I wanna increase my scores. But we also do a lot of context setting, particularly when we change phases. A great example I have is like some games in prototype um, we'll get pretty good scores in prototype, and but that's maybe a prototype build. And when they hit pre-production, maybe they completely change their engine. And so there's a, definitely a conversation that comes down to leads, and they usually disseminate this to the team, which is, hey, for the first few tests that you're in the new build, you're probably going to see lower scores. That's fine. We're looking for patterns and trends. We're looking for the qual feedback here. You know, we expect you eventually to reach what you achieved before and surpass that in your scores. But we have a lot of kind of context that we give the teams to remind them, you know, don't fixate just on boosting up these scores. And beyond the scores, our teams are really good at developing, you know, unique batteries per studies, things that they're interested in that aren't tied to our holistic benchmarks. And so they know the moments in which the holistic benchmarks are important and they're going to go to stakeholders. Those moments we all collectively agree on and we say, yeah, you know, do, do focus on the scores here. Like, do try and make sure your game is actually going to hit these well. But we provide enough context usually that when it comes to check-in tests or just like the general ebb and flow, they're okay with seeing scores go up and down. They, they've become very um, accepting of the fact that like the best thing we get out of all of this is insights, right? So if something goes bad on your game, they don't necessarily feel terrible about that. They're happy to learn that. And so they've, they've learned to really grasp onto the fact that, yeah, at the end of the day, it's about the insights less than the scores. You're gonna wanna get the good scores when you hit your major milestones, but otherwise, if you get a bad score and there's a clear reason why and you can go fix that in your game, that's a win. One other thing that we do that I think helps make Tom's point uh, more top of mind uh, when we actually deliver the reports is uh, the, the sort of executive summary slide that we have does not just contain the benchmarking, there's actually a fairly large portion of that, which is all about the milestone goals for the test specifically. They're literally to the left, they're the first thing that you have to read. And then on the holistic benchmarking scores that come up as part of that as well, because we do measure them and we do care, um, it layers in context from the, the play test, as well as the qualitative that is speaking to like why this is the case, which can also in layer in context from previous things, which is actually this goes back to why the continuity of having the researcher there throughout the process is helpful, especially once they've run like five or six of these, they get a sense for the pattern and what's going on and can provide that. Um, and you know, the relationship like in most things just goes a long way, so. Uh, yes. Uh, question from Discord. Thank you. Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, <laughs> I would say we have a, look, oh sorry, uh, repeat the question, my bad. Yeah, he said, yeah. <laughs> thank you, tell me every time. Um, if, I, if I recall correctly, it is, um, can we speak a little bit to the sample size around uh, getting a good read on holistic resonance? Yeah, so you know, the, 
the really unhelpful answer that everybody knows and probably if they were up here would say, like I would, is it really depends on the game and what their needs are. Um, but I would say in most cases, we're looking at somewhere between I would say 12 to 24 or 30 per cohort and depending on what the nature of the test is. And what's important to note about this is at those sample sizes, it's not like you can look at these at any like five point scale aggregate and just be like, that's exactly what that is, right? Um, so it's heavily triangulated with both qualitative and observational data to get a sense of, of what is actually there. Um, again, depending on the game, that number might I would say that number generally never gets lower, um, but it might go sub substantially higher. And if it's a test of particular significance and we really want confidence for some reason because there's a lot of importance, and this, I'd say that doesn't usually happen, um, but if it does, that's a place where we might just bump it for statistical power. Uh, I think there was somebody over there. Or did you? Okay, cool. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, as we, uh, as we go through the development and the play tests uh, get larger, the game gets more developed, do the metrics themselves change in some way? And, and I would sort of infer like how or why. And the answer is yes. Um, and that is largely driven by what is in the game. Um, because more tends to be injected into it. So early on, if you've just got a, like, a small slice on like characters or something like that, you just can't ask other questions. Like you can still ask some of these holistic benchmarking questions, but there's other stuff is. But especially once games tend to hit prototype, you see a lot more of, depending on the game, potentially like meta systems or supporting systems coming online. Things that maybe the team didn't have um, as much concern about from a risk standpoint um, and, and uh, are now worth building up. And so now you might start getting those questions in and layering those in, both for the specifics of a given milestone, but also they might layer into like game level KPIs um, as things that are core to that game that you would measure. And then by the time you get to production, I mean, you're, you're potentially talking about all the things nuanced with many audiences. Tom? I'll throw in just a little bit more there, which is that as the size increases, all that is true, but like the holistic benchmarks, not a whole lot changes there. I'm still collecting the usual same things there. More so than size of study, I would say length is what changes me up the most. So if I go from running, you know, 24 people in a, a one day study to a week long study with 40 people, the thing that's more important there to me is the week long rather than that we've sized up to 40 when it comes to the metrics I'm actually asking. And so then we start to really incorporate a larger set of longitudinal, right? We're collecting our holistics probably each and every day to compare those against one another, very similar to what was in the last talk, if anybody else was in this room. But yeah, the focus area there is definitely, okay, when you got people for multiple days, you want to see the changes. You want to see their changes in comprehension. You want to see their changes in enjoyment. You want to see a particular events that are maybe tied to specific days of testing have certain outsized impacts. Maybe they really had a bad time on day two because that was the day they struggled the most to get you know, clear the skill gap with the other players, stuff like that. And so I find that when I move to multi-day studies, even though I have the ability to split my survey questions across multiple days, and that hypothetically should shorten how much you need to give players that day, I tend to have longer surveys surveys on the multi-day studies because I do have a lot, a lot, a lot of different longitudinal things I like to collect. And our players just love long surveys, yeah, so. Love long <laughs> just like everybody here. I, Paul, show of hands, how many people here are actually just like bad at remembering to take surveys? I have this hypothetical that like researchers are actually just as bad as everybody else at wanting to take surveys. I mean, it's me, but it's you don't have to out yourself. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think there were, uh, there's a question in the back.
<laughs> yeah no 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 I know what you mean so I'll, I'll try and I'll, I'll, I'll try and paraphrase so the question is sometimes sorry context and question sometimes the risk in thesis is around the technology and the technology capabilities have you run into that and how do you deal with it and I would say Yes, it is absolutely a thing. And it's not even, I think, relegated to um, uh, the examples that, look, well, they're not even spicy at this point, <laughs> that you gave, right? Um, you can have games where the amount of content creation is like bonkers, right? Like Fortnite is like a great example where like if you tried to pitch Fortnite right now, you're like, okay, cool. So you're going to somehow have like a team of 300 people? You know what I mean, right? Like just like turning out, right? So that that context should be vetted very early on when you're coming up with a core thesis. And as a tactical way that I might approach that is likely this is a place where stakeholders and senior stakeholders will be very good in this process when you're coming up with that because those are going to be the folks of like the engineering person, you know, who's the discipline for R&D, engineering is going to be like, that's crazy town. You know what I mean? Right? Like they're going to be engaged in that process or there might be a technical director, whoever the lead engineer on that prototyping team is, is meant to bring their technical expertise. So while we focused a lot on like research and EP and game design and stuff like that, because that's our field, technical directors are absolutely in those leadership conversations and, and contributing their perspective. They also, I would say, tend to be very deep into the game space as well, which lends them to having you know, vision capabilities and they're more senior folks. So that's probably the way that I would inoculate most against that. Look, there's always going to be unknowns that you discover partway through. Even if you're like, hey, we identified this risk. We think we have a really good B. We need to develop for a year. And then you feel like, oh God, we had no idea. And then you just need to have like a really good, honest conversation between the team and the stakeholders and just be like, what are we, what are we doing here? And is that the right call? And sometimes it might be, and sometimes it might not. And I, I know that's simplifying a bit, but it's 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 weirdly true that like if you have that solid trusting relationship between those folks and everybody's just like kind of being intellectually honest, it it does work out. It isn't necessarily always the most efficient and it's not super clean all the time, but I would say you can find it well before three years into the process. Yeah. I'll just add a tiny bit onto that kind of a sidebar. I think the thesis validation talk a little bit later today will touch on this a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, because when we are doing our prioritization processes for figuring out, you know, what, which thesis components to tackle, a component that sometimes gets involved in that is, hey, you know, there's a technological hurdle. We need to build X before we do Y. And so even if something is like high importance or high ambiguity, we want to tackle that. Um, that may be something that it's like the de designers usually come in at that point and say, hey, I'm working on this system. Until I have the system done, I can't show you this. And until I show you that, we cannot do X. And so we see a lot of that processing. We try and get as in front of that as we can because, yeah, some of these tech hurdles can take a while to overcome. Uh, but that's been our process so far. Yes. Hello. Uh, so the question is, um, how do we get to a place where there is this good triple check system and, um, and sort of a healthy conversation between folks? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not the best person to answer that. Um, I actually think for that, um, you would probably want to talk to, to my supervisor, Jim McArdle, uh, as he and, um, you know, Betsy Anderson from our organization, um, really pioneered a lot of that stuff. What I would say at a high level, having not sort of lived through it and been the one to like do all the groundwork is they built really, really strong relationships with um, basically senior leadership within R&D. And that is the work of years, right? Um, and it, I would say, it takes the right people in the right situation, the right context, understanding that and, and building that. Once that was in place, they basically could then converse in the room about what a process for R&D would look like that would be sane. And so, 
you know, one of the the heads of R and D is um, is I think a really good mix of um, both you know highly analytical and intellectual and also very creative and very responsive to the idea of just like well thought out things. Um, and you know, if you've seen The Good Place, there's this notion of like you know the um, having a really good like you know bull shirt detector. Um, and so uh, you know. I think you can get into a situation with research and data where you can put a lot of numbers in front of folk and they're just like, is that what, wait, what? You know, that doesn't, and so those are the kinds of conversations that I think have gone a long way and having those over time has. And I know that's glossing over it and it doesn't give you the right roadmap to it, um, but, uh, but that's about the extent of what I could probably say, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, the question is, is there a reason why the game thesis is decided upon before the audience? I would say it's probably not that clean. Like, it looks more clean in the presentation than it is, right? Like, that can start from anywhere. There's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing where, like, you're like, yo, these players seem like they're, you know, it's, it, or, hey, this game. And so that tends to be a little bit of a looping iterative process. I think the, what we tend to see more often is folks aligning to a particular game or experience that they really love and, and you know, sort of mentally stubbing in the folks who play that experience and then kind of figuring out their motivations and going from there. But as you go through that process, and that tends to be the natural starting point for like designers and folks who are just really into games, um, uh, then you start to come up to questions like, okay, well, but really who are these players? Because at some point we become not them when we're deeply developing in it. That's what it looks like probably more in practice um, because it's easier to align to, but it's not super clean if that helps. Cool, anything else on, online? All right, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I think we can give like 15 minutes back.